I would uh, like to thank the organizers for putting together this wonderful conference, and it's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, I feel particularly honored to speak here as one of Nadi's former students on the occasion of his birthday, um, which is really a good opportunity for all of us to share and celebrate our appreciation of Nadi and his work. So first and foremost, happy birthday, Nadi, and thank you for everything you have taught me and for continuing to inspire not just me, but so many of us. And uh, I'm looking forward to many more years of learning things from you. So my talk um, is a little bit vaguely titled, but of course, Nadi is famous for developing powerful tools for exploring and studying supersymmetric RG flows. And I'm going to report on some work in progress with Guido Fastuccia, who is here, and also Michele Del Zotto about some new tools that we can use to do a little bit more. Um, so one thing that Nani has continually articulated over the last couple of years is the fact that despite its phenom phenomenal successes, quantum field theory is still a work in progress. And here is a, an eloquent quote um, from Nani that says, there are indications that we're still missing big things, and that means perhaps quantum field theory should be reformulated. So if we want to do better, we are limited by our inability to control the dynamics of non-trivial interacting field theories. And because of that, it's natural to look for simplifying limits, like topological field theories, conformal field theories, various kinds of weak coupling limits, et cetera. And supersymmetric quantum field theories have the interesting feature that they can both display very rich non-conformal dynamics, so non-trivial RG flows, and nevertheless, they have some protected or BPS quantities that can be analyzed exactly. So the quintessential example, which is very much associated with Nani, is the superpotential W in N equals one theories. It's holomorphic in all dynamical fields, but it's also holomorphic in all background chiral superfields, and therefore some coupling constants. So in favorable situations, tracking these protected quantities along the RG flow gives you a good picture of the dynamics. And with this in mind, we would like to expand our list of protected observables and to deepen our understanding of them. A large and interesting class of such observables are supersymmetric partition functions, Z, on a compact spacetime manifold M. And the classic example of that is the Witten index, which is a path integral on a torus. It can also be interpreted as a trace over the Hilbert space of states on a torus of one lower dimension times time with the appropriate factor of minus one to the F. This index is naturally defined in essentially any non-conformal supersymmetric theories, and it counts with sign the supersymmetric vacua on the torus, and because it counts something, we call it an index. Uh, and if you vary continuous parameters in the theory, um, and one such variation is the RG flow itself, then that typically does not change the value of the index, but of course, along the variation, some vacua may pair up and acquire positive energy without changing, changing the answer. Nevertheless, this index can display subtle wall crossing phenomena, and sometimes it's ill-defined. More recently, we've seen many examples of interesting supersymmetric indices defined as path integrals on manifolds of topology, a sphere times a circle. And these also count supersymmetric states on the sphere times time in Hamiltonian quantization. And they're most naturally defined in superconformal theories, because there you can go to the space using a conformal map. So in those theories, they count short or BPS local operators in flat space because of the state operator correspondence. And they're also independent of exactly marginal couplings if the CFT has them. Uh, and they're very robust because the theory on a compact sphere typically has a discrete spectrum and a normalizable vacuum. Now, just as the Witten index on a torus, it can sometimes happen that these indices on spheres times circles uh, can be defined away from the conformal point for non-conformal supersymmetric theories. And this immediately raises a bunch of questions. So, for example, it's not at all obvious when this can be done or how one would preserve supersymmetry on such a space away from the conformal point. Moreover, there might be additional choices, um, additional parameters that you discover if you try to do that that were not visible in flat space. And then you might ask whether the index depends on them. And because there's no obvious state operator map in a non-conformal theory, it's also not completely clear what the index counts. Uh, one obvious truism is that 
if you want to explore supersymmetric RG flows, you should really think about an index that's defined away from the critical point. So a systematic approach to analyzing supersymmetric quantum field theory in curved space was developed by Nari in collaboration with Guido Fastuccia. And perhaps just this once, for today, we can refer to it as Nari Fastuccia. <laughs> <laughs> I must duly give credit to Zohar Komogoski for coming up with that. <laughs> the main idea of their approach is that the non-dynamical background metric on the space-time manifold must reside in an off-shell supergravity multiplet. And this is a powerful and natural extension of the principle that all uh, background fields and all coupling constants should reside in superfields. And this is a, uh, a formalism that's been around for a little while, and I recently had a chance to review it, uh, if you'd like to learn more. I will very briefly review it here. Um, one good way of thinking about it is that the coupling of a flat space field theory to background supergravity proceeds via the flat space stress tensor, T, and its superpartners, which can be bosonic and fermionic. So the metric couples to T, and then you include appropriate sources for both the bosonic and the fermionic operators. And the Siegel terms here are higher order in the background fields. Um, so if you look at this Lagrangian, and you want to make a sensible field theory, uh, then typically you only activate the bosonic background fields, the metric, and perhaps the other Bs, but you set all the uh, fermionic background fields to zero. And then that set of field configurations preserves some supersymmetry if the SUSY variation of the, uh, of the fermionic background fields is zero. Uh, so this is an interesting set of conditions, which among other things always includes equations like this, which are killing spinner-like equations for the bosonic fields and the spinner that parametrizes Q. And these equations determine all possible supersymmetric backgrounds for the bosonic field, so the metric and the other bosonic backgrounds. Now, typically activating only the metric is not enough to preserve supersymmetry. Roughly speaking, that's because the stress tensor is not Q-closed in flat space. Um, and it's typically also not enough to just tell, say what the metric is in order to specify the whole background. It's important to say what the other bosonic background fields are. Uh, and once you've specified such a background, the supersymmetry algebra and the Lagrangians on that background follow from supergravity. So it turns out that one can use this to construct unitary n equals to one theories on a space of topology S3 times R, and the S3 is round of radius L. Uh, this was done by various people and then analyzed using this technology by Fastuccia and Cyber. And the supersymmetry algebra is deformed from the flat space algebra to the superalgebra SU2 slash one. So there are four supercharges, a complex doublet Q and its complex conjugate that anti-commute to the SU2 in the superalgebra here, J are the SU2 generators. Then there's a U1R symmetry and there's a Hamiltonian, which is central. Um, and in this scenario, the SU2 generators that appear here are either the left or the right isometries of the S3. So if you look at the supergravity coupling in this language, you'll discover that this background requires you to turn both uh, a background gauge field A for the R symmetry, couples to the flat space R current, and a background value for some other type of vector V that is less intuitive, that couples to a vector operator X that is not even a conserved current. And both of these need to be turned on in order to preserve supersymmetry. And from this coupling, you see that more or less any R current that you pick in flat space is as good as any other. And the couplings on S3 explicitly via this formula depend on this choice. This coupling here turns out to vanish if the theory is conformal. But if the theory is not conformal, it's essential for preserving supersymmetry. And again, in the conformal case, this SU2 slash one algebra that one defines here is embedded into the full superconformal algebra. Roughly speaking, you identify Q dagger with one of the superconformal generators, and the central H is some combination of the dilatation generator and R. Now, SU2 slash one uh, representations satisfy interesting unitarity bounds. So the energy is bounded from below in terms of the SU2R and the U1R quantum numbers. Uh, when these inequalities are saturated, you obtain short representations. So you could try to count them using an index. And this index is defined like this. You can think of it either as a trace uh, over states on the S3. And because the Hamiltonian is central, you get to in insert a fugacity Q for it. Or alternatively, you could think of it as a path integral on S3 times S1 with the S1 compactified. So Q here, roughly speaking, is the exponential of the radius of the S1 divided by the radius of the S3. And then there's a powerful non-renormalization theorem 
which states that this index is in fact independent of all deformations of the field theory that preserve the SU2 slash 1 superalgebra. Uh, roughly speaking, that's because the energy of the short representations that are being counted by the index can be expressed in terms of the SU2 rotation quantum number, which is quantized, and the U1R quantum number, which cannot change if the deformations you study preserve the U1R symmetry. So this simple powerful argument tells you that that index is in fact deformation invariant. Using this idea, you can set, for example, all the coupling constants to zero, if you have a Lagrangian, and compute in a free theory, often it's a free SCFT. And in that case, the index reduces to a simple matrix integral counting gauge invariant local operators. Now the RG flow itself is a continuous deformation that preserves the symmetry. And therefore the index can also be computed anywhere along the flow, either in a UV or IR description. And for that reason, it must also match across non-trivial IR dualities, where two different UV theories flow to the same theory in the infra infrared. So a quintessential example is Lybrook duality. This was tested in papers by these people. And in this situation, everything is well-defined and works more or less as I've explained, as long as the spectrum of the Hamiltonian on S3 is discrete. Um, now, there are situations when the theory becomes a bit degenerate. Since the Lagrangian on the sphere dependent on the R charges, it can happen that um, you have in the theory a scalar field phi of, of R charge zero, and then it turns out that the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is continuous. That's because the curvature coupling for phi on the sphere is actually a non-trivial function of the R charge. And that function has a zero when you set the R charge to zero. So zero R charge scalars have flat directions that imply a divergence in the index that's physical and difficult to cure. And one problem uh, with that is that this situation happens very naturally in non-conformal n equals to two theories. So if you're in a conformal n equals to two theory, you have both an SU2R symmetry and a U1R symmetry. And you can use some combination of them to define a nice index. Um, but in non-conformal n equals to two theories, you almost always just have the SU2R symmetry and almost never the U1R. And in that case, you have vector multiplet scalars that are uncharged under the SU2R. So you're precisely in this scenario, which means that if you try to apply this kind of index to an n equals to two theory, it will simply diverge. That's frustrating because we would think that n equals to two allows us to do more than n equals to one. So we would like to search for an n equals to two index that's defined away from the critical point and doesn't suffer from these issues. A good starting point is to start with a superconformal theory, but to just refuse to use any of the conformal generators. Um, so if we do that, we can still map the theory to the cylinder as three times r, but now we will look for a subalgebra of the superconformal algebra that only includes actual isometries of the space and the SU2R symmetry. And the largest subalgebra turns out to be yet again SU2 slash one. So it's algebraically exactly the same as before, but it turns out to be differently embedded and, and acting differently geometrically. So this formula is exactly the same as I had before, except that R3 is now the carton of the SU2R symmetry. And J, which before was a generator for one of the chiral SU2 rotations on the sphere, is now a generator of the diagonal SU2. And if you happen to be in a superconformal theory, then this SU2 slash one is embedded in the full superconformal algebra. And short multiplets of this algebra turn out to satisfy this shortening condition in the language of the superconformal theory. And the index that counts such multiplets has actually been studied before. It's precisely what is called the sure limit of the superconformal index that you can define in n equals to two theories that was introduced and extensively studied by these people and afterwards by many others. So we would like to construct non-conformal n equals to two theories on S3 times, times time that realize precisely this diagonal SU2 slash one. So we'll follow the background supergravity formalism of Festucci and Cyborg to do that. First, we choose a stress tensor multiplet in flat space. And essentially, all interesting n equals to two theories that have an SU2R symmetry also have a, a certain distinguished kind of stress tensor multiplet that was first described by Sonius. This multiplet has many operators, so I apologize. It starts its life with a scalar t, which is real. And then you act with supersymmetry to find the other operators. So there's some fermions that are not too, too important for us. But all of these fields will be interesting. 
there's a two-form W, which does not satisfy any type of conservation equation. There's the SU2R current here, capital R. There's little, little r, which may or may not be a conserved current. S is the supersymmetry current, and here the superscript I is an SU2 doublet index, SU2R doublet index. And here at the top you find the stress tensor. That's all the operators you have in a superconformal theory. If the theory is not conformal, you have more operators. Roughly speaking, they're the superpartners of the trace of the stress tensor. So you find some complex scalars, x, k is also a complex scalar, and very interestingly, you find a complex conserved current, z mu, which you should think of as the conserved current that gives rise to the n equals 2 central charge in the nonconformal theory. And now we follow the rule, and we simply introduce a background supergravity field for each of these operators. So for each red operator, you will introduce a blue supergravity field. Uh, most of them I haven't given interesting names, except for the gauge field. So V is the SU2R gauge field. Uh, G, of course, is the metric. And C is going to be the central charge gauge field. That one's going to come up quite a bit. Um, and observe that because the central charge has dimensions of mass, the central charge current actually has dimension 4. That means that in this normalization, C is a dimensionless gauge field, which is not the normal normalization. And now, we just solve the equation for finding supersymmetric backgrounds. So we take the variation of the supergravity fermions, and we set that to 0. So we get some interesting set of equations, and we can try to find the solution of the type that we're looking for. So we found a solution where the metric is just the round metric on the sphere, uh, exactly as in the conformal case. And here I'm presenting it as a round S2 fibered over an interval theta with this interesting function. And altogether, that describes a round sphere. So here's a cartoon. The blue S3 here describes the round sphere. The green interval is the theta interval with theta running from 0 to pi. And here you have S2s of varying radii that describe the round S3. So the metric has full SO4 isometry. But in fact, many of the other background fields break that SO4 isometry to the diagonal subgroup. And I've schematically indicated that in red here. These schematically stand for some of the other background fields that have some non-trivial profile on the sphere, and they break the isometry. And similarly, some of them also break the full SU2R symmetry just down to the Cartan. So I've schematically indicated, roughly speaking, what the background fields look like. For example, the central charge gauge field is pointing along time, but it has a non-trivial profile on the, on the S3. It varies like cosine theta. And there's a non-trivial complex phase, zeta, which is just a complex number, but it also turns out to be an actual source, an actual coupling constant in the Lagrangian. That phase will be interesting later on. In fact, this background preserves four supercharges that precisely give you the desired SU2 slash 1 that we were looking for. So we've succeeded in doing that, and now we would like to analyze the dynamics of n equals to 2 theories in this background. So the first comment is that the theory is unitary, because even though it may not have been obvious from the pre previous slide, all the background fields had the standard reality conditions. Um, another thing that I will just tell you without proving it is that there's no problem with vector multiplets. All these background fields do in induce a non-trivial mass term for the scalars in the vector multiplet, so this problem is cured. Now, we've broken a bunch of symmetries, and if you go back to the conformal point, you would want these symmetries to be restored. So you can check that precisely when the theory is conformal, either these couplings vanish or you can redefine them away. Uh, and in that case, the phase zeta that I was talking about actually specifies the embedding of the SU2 slash 1 algebra into the full n equals to 2 superconformal algebra. And you can think of the U1R symmetry that appears at the superconformal point as rotating zeta. Now, in nonconformal theories, all these background fields that break the isometries in SU2R are there, and they lead to fairly complicated position-dependent mass terms and derivative couplings. That sounds a little bit daunting. The, the title here is a little bit fastidious because it's the title of a paper that Nadi wrote about the BFSS matrix model. Um, it will not have any relation to what I'm going to say. Now, uh, I don't know exactly what is the smartest way to, to deal with these uh, position-dependent couplings, but we can immediately apply the powerful SU2 slash 1 non-renormalization theorem that we already used in n equals to 1 theories, which tells us that as long as we preserve SU2 slash 1, we can make any continuous deformation that we like. Uh, and again, we find that the index, defined exactly as before, is deformation invariant. This is literally the same formula that I wrote previously. It just needs to be appropriately reinterpreted in terms of the new SU2 slash 1. So in any renormalizable gauge theory, we can write down a Lagrangian, 
we can simply use the deformation invariance of the index to set all coupling constants and masses to zero, and that means we can compute as if the theory were a free theory in the UV. This leads to exactly the same kind of matrix model that you would dif discover in conformal gauge theories that was described by these people. And you only need to do a minimal modification of the integrand of the matrix model to account for the modified matter content. Now, more interesting is the fact that it should also be possible to compute the index in the deep infrared. And that alternative point of view should allow you to make contact with recent conjectures of various authors, some of whom are here, relating the index to BPS particles on the Coulomb branch. Now, there's an immediate puzzle that this line of reasoning leads to. We argued that the index does not depend on continuous parameters. So let's just take a very simple example. Let's take a free hypermultiplet and add a mass term. Um, we argued that the index doesn't depend on it, but this seems completely inconsistent with naive decoupling. You would expect that as you take the mass to be very large, uh, as long as you just consider the theory in flat space, the IR is actually completely trivial. It's the empty theory. And the empty theory has index one. And the corresponding expectation on S3 times time is that you expect all non-vacuum states to have energies that scale like the mass and go to infinity when the mass becomes very large. So we seem to have a paradox. In fact, the situation is more interesting. We have all these position-dependent background fields on S3, and they lead to a position-dependent mass function for various modes, including some of the scalars, for example, of the hypermultiplet. So I've plotted here the, the scalar mass squared as a function of theta um, across the sphere. And roughly speaking, so the sphere has radius L, and theta still runs from 0 to pi. Um, and roughly speaking, what you find is that this mass function kind of asymptotes to m squared on one side. So if we take m to infinity, the mass here will be enormous. But as a function of theta, you find that it can become small, and even cross 0, and even become slightly tachyonic. This only happens in a very small re region near the other pole. But the mass function in this, this region is not of order the UV scale m. It's of order the IR scale set by the radius of the sphere. And that means that even if m is very large, you can have localized modes near this region, whose energy scales like the inverse radius of the sphere, which is much, much smaller than the mass that goes to infinity. And these modes don't decouple even in the large mass limit. Now, the physical reason for why this non-decoupling happens and for why these modes can even exist is because we turn on background fields that in the right units are enormously strong. The coupling of the gravity photon, as I said, is a little bit weird because we, we, we write it as a dimensionless vector field coupling to a dimension four current. Normally, we would think that a gauge field has dimension one. So the physical gauge field should, roughly speaking, be thought of as the mass times the dimensionless gravity photon. So the physical gauge field and its field strength actually scale with the mass and become strong. It's just that because of supersymmetry, everything is finely tuned so that the gravity photon always couples to the mass of particles in exactly the right way as to scale uh, like this. So we have not violated decoupling. We've turned on an enormously strong non-trivial gauge field, background gauge field. Um, this is not something that you would normally allow yourself to do as a low energy observer, for instance, um, if you were a, a, an observer living in the deep IR of that theory where the hypermultiplet has mass m, you would not allow yourself to explore electric fields whose field strength grows like M. Um, good. Now, we can do more things with our index. Um, near the two poles of the S3, this S2 on which the diagonal SU2 acts non-trivially shrinks and, and becomes zero. So the SU2 slash 1 algebra that I was talking about actually locally contracts to a subalgebra of flat space supersymmetry. It's just a subalgebra sub of the usual flat space Poincare supersymmetry algebra. And it turns out to be precisely the, the algebra preserved by a BPS particle whose central charge is parallel to the phase zeta that I was mentioning before. Remember that zeta was an actual coupling constant in our theory, or its antiparticle if you look at the other pole. Now, very interestingly, the same algebra is also preserved by certain half BPS line operators studied by these authors in particular and many others. These type of line operators in flat space have the property that they're supported on straight lines, let me call them L, and they are invariant under the maximal unbroken bosonic symmetry that such an operator could have if you only thought about nonconformal symmetries. So there's an SU2R symmetry, which is unbroken, but there's also a transverse SU2 of rotation that fixed the line operator, and that they demand is also unbroken. So a simple example is a Wilson line of charge Q for an abelian gauge field, capital A, 
and its scalar superpartners phi and phi bar. So this particular combination is an example of such a half BPS line operator, a very familiar one. So th precisely these kind of line defects can be inserted into our S3 times R background if we place them at the poles where the S2 shrinks and wind them around the time direction or extend them around time if, if we don't compactify. Now, another thing we can do is to find a family of deformations of our background where the S3 is no longer round. That's not such a big deal because we broke the isometries anyway. And it turns out that you can make the radius of the S2 that was fibered over the interval an arbitrary bounded function of theta. So this is one example of such a space. It's kind of something like a cigar, but I wanted to draw some wiggles just to emphasize that it doesn't need to be regular in any way. Um, and here I indicated in the middle a long region where the radius is roughly constant. Um, so this is supposed to be something of topology S3. I've suppressed the time direction. And in the middle here, I have a long region where the topology is approximately S2 times R. Now, any choice of this function, f of theta, preserves the full SU2 slash 1 symmetry that our index had. And by exactly the same SU2 slash 1 non-renormalization argument that we have used several times already, the index will be unchanged for any choice of f. One interesting choice of f that we could examine is just constant f. So this is precisely the situation when these S2s here uh, don't shrink or grow. And then we obtain a space whose geometry is actually S2 with constant radius and a Minkowskian two-dimensional space, R1, comma 1. In this special situation, our SU2 slash 1 superalgebra is enhanced to SU2 slash 2, saying that its SU2 slash 2 is a little bit imprecise because you might think it only has one central charge. In fact, SU2 slash 2 can have up to three central charges. And here we can use two of them to get the momentum operators on R11. So this SU2 slash 2 is something like a Poincare supersymmetry algebra in two dimensions. But it has on the right-hand side not just the momenta, but also both the SU2R symmetry generators and the SU2 rotation generators that act on the S2 factor. So this is a very interesting and somewhat exotic flat space supersymmetry algebra. Uh, but it has actually come up before. It was studied by various groups of people, including by um, Itzaki Kudasov and Cyberg, and by Lenin Malasena, maybe a little more than 10 years ago. And more recently, um, by a number of authors in the context of um, 3D transcendence matter theories, like ABGM theory and its generalizations, um, which all admit a massive deformation that leads to a non-conformal gap theory with this superalgebra. So this superalgebra is a bit exotic, but it's not completely unfamiliar. Now, if you study the unitarity bounds for SU2 slash 2, you can show that the theory on this background, S2 times two-dimensional Minkowski space, must actually be a fully gap theory that's an unusual situation. Typically, we can't say much about the spectrum just from the flat space superalgebra. But here you can because the R symmetry generators sit on the right-hand side. And therefore, it cannot have any massless or degenerate or continuously connected vacua, but it can have a bunch of isolated, fully gapped vacua. And all of these vacua are annihilated by all the supersymmetries. And they also must be invariant under both the SU2R and the SU2 rotation symmetry that acts on the S2. And because of this special algebra and the enhanced supersymmetry, it turns out that those vacua are totally protected. So typically, when you have an index, it's possible that vacua, even vacua, could pair up and become positive energy states. But in this case, that's forbidden by the algebra. So these, algebra, th these, these vacuum states are totally rigid. And you can deform the coupling constants, or the RG scale, or the radius of the S2. And the vacuum will always stay a vacuum. Now, the claim in this context is that these vacua are actually in one-to-one -one correspondence with precisely the half-BPS line operators that were studied by Gajotomor and Neitzke and that we reviewed a couple of slides ago. And the way you see that, roughly speaking, is by looking at path integrals on semi-infinite cigars, just like Chakotay and Waffa did in the context of 2D TT star. So let me go back to this picture in order to explain that. You could start 
uh, with this picture here. And remember that there was also an extra R direction, which in this picture was interpreted as time. Now we'll flip the picture, and we'll kind of think of this direction as time, and this additional direction as space. And you can start with a, s a state on S2 times R here. And then you can, can imagine doing a path integral where you cap off the cigar smoothly, preserving SU2 slash 1. And then you produ produce here a very localized, supersymmetric state that is preserved by exactly the flat space supercharges corresponding to a, to a line operator. So by doing this path integral here, you go from a state to a line operator. You can also do it the other way around. You can insert a line operator at the tip, and then you do a path integral on the same semi-infinite cigar. And if the cigar is very long, then eventually you'll project into the vacuum state, because I've already argued that the theory is gapped. So this argument is closely analogous to the one that was used in 2D to relate chiral operators in 2,2 theories to um, vacua on S1, even if the theories are nonconformal. So let me just give one simple example of that. If you consider a free abelian gauge theory in four dimensions with n equals to two supersymmetry, and you put it on this space, S2 times R11, then um, one sector that you get in two dimensions is just axial electrodynamics, at least for the uh, bosonic fields. So act by that, I, I just mean a, a 2D U1 gauge field, so that's its kinetic term, and also a 2D scalar, script phi. Phi is a real scalar. It's going to be one linear combination of the two scalars in the n equals to 2 vector multiplet in 4D. And importantly, it's not compact. So it has a kinetic term, and then there's an axiom coupling, phi f. And phi is a non-compact scalar. So it's well known that this uh, system induces a non-trivial potential for the axion, which is roughly speaking quadratic in phi. But because phi is non-compact, and the axion potential has to be periodic, you actually get an infinite potential that is periodic and has infinitely many vacua. And these vacua are labeled by an integer q that could be either positive or negative. So these are the vests for phi. And the claim is that under the correspondence I outlined on the previous slide, these are in one-to-one -one correspondence with BPS Wilson lines. So here I've just described the electric sector. There's a decoupled, more or less identical sector um, that comes also from 4D, which gives you the corresponding magnetic vacuum and magnetic lines. And together you get a two-dimensional lattice of dionic line operators and the corresponding vacuum. Um, I will only scratch the surface with this very last comment, but this state operator correspondence for line operators, at least for these very special ones, explains many of the features that have been observed in other contexts. For example, on the previous slide, or maybe two slides ago, one of the defining features of these line defects was that, that they were invariant both under SU2R and under SU2 rotation. That was part of the definition. But here that we see that that has a very natural interpretation uh, in terms of the vacua on S2 times R2, because those vacua necessarily by the algebra are invariant under precisely the same symmetry. More interestingly, because uh, as I've argued before, the vacua are totally rigid and can be tracked along all continuous deformations and RG flows, you can, for example, try to explain the one-to-one -one correspondence between UV line defects of this kind and infrared line defects on the Coulomb branch in the abelian description where you just have dionic line operators. So in many examples, it was observed that there's an actual one-to-one -one correspondence between the microscopic line defects and the infrared line defects. And this uh, setup can help explain that. So um, these are more or less the things I wanted to explain. And I'm going to conclude with the following list. We define a new index that can be thought of as a partition function on S3 times S1, with a lot of other things turned on. And uh, this index is well-defined and exists in non-conformal n equals to two theories. But if you go to a superconformal theory, it coincides with what people call the Schur, in Schur index, or the Schur limit of the superconformal index. And um, supergravity background fields and an SU2 slash 1 non-renormalization theorem played an important role in all of the arguments. So both of these are things that were supplied by the work of Nani and Guido. Now, you can try to compute that index in asymptotically free or conformal gauge theories, 
And in that case, we argue that it simply reduces to a matrix model. This is kind of a UV computation, and it's very simple. We also argued that the index is independent of mass deformations, among other things, and naively, this clashes with the decoupling of heavy states. And there was a non-trivial piece of physics going on that explained why there was no paradox. There's no paradox because the background fields we had to turn on in order to preserve supersymmetry are very strong, and they can pull down massive states and make at least some of them very light. Now, the goal is to now throw this index at some infrared computation, since it's an RG invariant. And you would, you would try to reproduce it from some type of computation that only uses low energy fields. Since you turn on very strong gauge fields, it's far from obvious that you can do that. But perhaps you can compute it in some type of intermediate description that only includes low energy fields plus maybe some massive fields. And of course, it's natural to suspect that the BPS states would be involved. And finally, the index can also be decorated with half BPS line defects. And as we argued at the very end, these are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the massive vacua of the original theory that you started with on this interesting S2 times R11 background with SU2 slash 2 symmetry. So that's all I was going to explain today. And I want to thank you for your attention. And most importantly, say again, happy birthday, Nadi. South Pole, and what you get depends on what this insertion is. You mean in the case of line operators, or in yeah. general? Yes. Uh, and that's what came out. This is what was left out of the massive particle. That this is what. Would, but in a way, it does violate decoupling because the same low energy theory has many different things that you can stick there. Are you saying that all of them give the same answer? I didn't make any claim about trying to reproduce the answer using just the low energy theory. Okay, so let me ask it differently. Imagine you have a theory with two hypermultiples. Mm -hmm. One of them has big mass. Yeah. It leaves something behind. Yes. Now you give mass to the other one, yeah. it leaves something else behind. So a low energy observer is going to get two different answers depending on whether we started with one or with two hypermultiplets. That's correct. Alternatively, even in the theory in the UV, you could say that you started with one. How do you know that there isn't another heavier You don't. Thing? In that sense, it does violate decoupling. But there was a physical reason for it. So it's not a paradox. This, this object is, in this sense, UV sensitive. It has the feature that if you, if, have, if you have five massive hypermultiplets with huge masses, then you will count the index for five hypermultiplets. And if you have two, you will count it for two, exactly as you said. So this is an index that is defined along RG flows, but it always tries to re reassemble the full UV answer which is very surprising. In that sense, it's completely different than the n equals to 1 index, where you start in the UV and you tune the R charges to shoot into some particular direction in the infrared, and you get different answers. Here, roughly speaking, you can shoot in any direction you want, and you will always get the same answer, which is the UV. I agree it's very surprising. I just wanted to emphasize that I don't think it violates any rules that I know of. Well, I was suggesting at the end, and this is supported by various conjectures uh, that people have put forward, that there might be an intermediate description where you allow yourself some knowledge of some massive physics, like the BPS spectrum, and that might be sufficient. So it would still be interesting, but I agree, you would never be able to reconstruct it just from the deep IR. Zohar? Two uh, very short questions. Uh, one is that uh, given the full infrared effective action, Let's say you possess the full infrared effective action. Would that be enough? That's that the first question. Okay. And the second question is that you mentioned in axion electrodynamics, there are infinitely many vacua. But actually, they're all identical, because phi going to phi plus 2 pi is a gauge symmetry. OK, let me answer the second question first, because I think it will be shorter. Phi is not compact, because it wasn't in the UV. Oh, did they turn me off? Um, Phi is non-compact, unlike the usual case that one typically studies. 
I, I, I emphasize that phi was non-compact. So it's like a, the Lagrangian is that of axial electrodynamics, but, but phi is non-compact, so the vacuum are distinguishable. The first question is more interesting, and one might wonder that if, if I give you the full effect of action in the deep infrared, including all the higher derivative terms and supergravity couplings and so forth, whether it might be enough to reassemble the UV answer. That's a lot of data. That's more data for, than, for example, the zyber quitten solution. But um, naively, you might still think that you're asking a question you're not entitled to know the answer to, which is what happens when I turn on a field whose field strength is of order the cutoff. But because of the supersymmetry involved, y you might think that you can get away with it. This is obviously something to do. Greg, other question? The correspondence between the UV and IR line defects depends on the Coulomb branch and exhibits uh, wall crossing. And so I'm wondering if there's an interesting story in terms of the massive vacua in these backgrounds preserving SU22. So can you relate that to wall crossing of uh, framed BPS dege degeneracies? Thanks for the question. It's a very good question. and. It was already suggested to me by, by various of your former co-authors. Um, I, I think it would be extremely interesting to study it. I haven't done it, and so I didn't make any claim about it. The only thing I wanted to emphasize here in this very primitive setup is that the number of vacua has to agree. You're asking a more refined question, which would be the next step. So for example, in this axial electrodynamics, because phi is non-compact, you have interesting solitons that interpolate between the vacua. It is an interesting 2D theory to study in its own right. It's a little bit different than a standard 2, 2 sigma model because of the funny superalgebra. It's time for one more question. Uh, in, in the situation with the hypermultiplet that you're massing up, before you massed up the, uh, the hypermultiplet, there were various modes of the hypermultiplet on S3, <laughs> but only a subset of the modes contributed to the index, I mean the supersymmetric mode. After you mass it up very much, are only the supersymmetric modes light? Or th That's correct. The ones that are light are precisely thank the supersymmetric you. ones. Okay, let's thank Thomas again.